Hi everyone. Hi I Survive readers and StoryWorks readers and all of you readers. Um, I'm Lauren Tarshis. That's my dog Roy barking because I think there's a cat outside. Um, you know, normally I'm in schools every week or Skyping with classrooms all the time. And now I'm home like I know many of you are home and I miss you. So I decided that every morning I'm going to do a little read aloud for you um, beginning today with my very first I Survive book, I Survive the Sinking of Titanic. And you know, one of the things that I wanted to just tell you all, because I know maybe some of you are a little afraid of what's happening right now with this, um, with people under quarantine and we're all working together to try to get through this. And what I've learned from history is that these kinds of things have happened before and um, people get through them. So I want you to also keep track of what you're thinking and feeling because maybe 50 years from now when someone wants to write about the, this virus and the quarantines, they're gonna wanna talk to you, just like I interview people who went through all sorts of events through history. So that's my little message. Now I'm gonna start reading I Survived the Sinking of Titanic. Monday, April 15th, 1912, two o'clock a.m. on the deck of the RMS Titanic. The Titanic was sinking. The gigantic ship had hit an iceberg. Land was far, far away. Ten-year-old George Calder stood on the deck. He shivered because the night was freezing cold and because he was scared, more scared than he'd ever been before, more scared than when Papa swore he'd send George to the army school, far from everything and everyone, more scared even than the time the Black Panther chased him through the woods back home in Millerstown, New York. The, death of the deck of the Titanic was packed with people. Some were running and shouting, help us, take my baby, jump. Some just plain screamed. Children cried, a gunshot exploded across the deck, but George didn't move. Just hold on, he told himself, gripping the rail, like maybe he could hold up the ship. He couldn't look down at the black water. He kept his eyes on the sky. He had never been, he'd never seen so many stars. Papa said Mama watched over him from heaven. Could Mama see him now? The ship lurched. We're going down, a man shouted. George closed his eyes, praying this was all a dream. Even more ter terrible sounds filled the air. Glass shattering, furniture crashing, more screams and cries. A bellowing sound like a giant beast was dying a terrible death. George tried to hold the rail, but he lost his grip. He tumbled, smashing his head on the deck. And then George couldn't see anything. Even the stars above him seemed to go black. So that's chapter one. Now, you guys who read, who've read other I Survive books know that I do something a little tricky in my chapter ones, which is it's not really the beginning of the story. It's kind of like a preview to let you know kind of what, what, what might happen later. And my goal in chapter one is to give you a little hint and then hope that you become really interested and want to keep reading. So I hope you want to keep listening because I'm going to read one more chapter, which is chapter two. So now it's 19 hours later, Sunday, April 14th, 1912, 7.15 a.m. First class suite, B deck, RMS Titanic. George woke up early that morning, half expecting to hear Papa calling him for chores. But then he remembered the Titanic. He was on the greatest ship in the world. It was their fifth day at sea. George and his eight-year-old sister Phoebe had spent two months in England with their Aunt Daisy. What a time they'd had. As a surprise for George's 10th birthday, Aunt Daisy took them to see the Tower of London, where they used to chop off your head if the king didn't like you. Now they were heading back to America, back to Papa and their little farm in upstate New York. George got out of bed and knelt by the small round window that looked out on the ocean. Morning, said Phoebe, peering through her, the silk curtains of her bed and fumbling for her spectacles. Those are glasses. Her curly brown hair was practically standing straight up. What are you looking for? George had to smile. Phoebe always had a question, even at the crack of dawn. Maybe that's why she was the smartest little sister in the world. I thought I saw a giant squid, George said, and it's coming to get us. George rushed over and grabbed Phoebe with wiggly squig arm, squid arms. She curled into a ball and laughed. She was still laughing when Aunt Daisy came in. 
Even in her robe and sisters, Aunt Daisy was the prettiest lady on the whole ship. Sometimes George couldn't believe she was so old, 22. What's this, Aunt Daisy said, you know the rule, no having fun without me. Phoebe sat up and put her arms around George. Georgie said he saw a giant squid. Aunt Daisy laughed, I wouldn't doubt it. Everyone wants to get a look at the Titanic, even sea monsters. George halfway believed it. He'd never imagined anything like the Titanic. Aunt Daisy called the ship a floating palace, but it was way better than the old and dusty castle they'd seen in England. They had three whole rooms, one for Phoebe and George, one for Aunt Daisy, and one for sitting around and doing nothing. They even had a man, a steward named Henry. He had bright red hair and an Irish accent that made everything sound like a jolly song. Some fresh towels for your bath, he would say, some cocoa before bed. And just before they turned out the lights for the night, Henry would knock on their door and peep his head in. Is there anything else you might need, he'd ask. George kept trying to think of something he needed, but what could you ever need on the Titanic? The ship had everything, even a swimming pool with ocean water heated up like a bath, even gold silk curtains for your bed so you could pretend you were sleeping in a pirate's den, even three dining rooms where you could eat anything you wanted. Last night, George had eaten two plates of roast beef, veal and ham pie, carrots sweet as candy, and a mysterious dessert called meringue pudding. It tasted like sugary clouds. Actually, there was one thing missing from the Titanic, the New York Giants baseball team. George wondered if Henry would, what Henry would say if George said, I need shortstop Artie Flesher right away. Probably Henry would say, coming right up, sir. George grinned just thinking about it. But Aunt Daisy wasn't smiling at him. She looked very serious. We have to make the most of our last three days at sea, Aunt Daisy said in a low voice. I want you to promise me, George, no more trouble. George gulped. Was she really still mad at him for last night? He'd slid down the banister of the grand staircase of the first class lobby. How could he resist? The wood was so shiny and polished, curving around like a ride at a fair. That lady would have moved, that, ma that lady could have moved out of the way, George said. How could she, Phoebe, Phoebe said. She was wearing a hundred pounds of diamonds. Aunt Daisy almost smiled, George could tell. No, she could never stay mad at George for long. Aunt Daisy put her face very close to George's. She had freckles on her nose, just like George and Phoebe. No more trouble, she repeated, tapping his chest. I don't want to send a telegram to your father. George's stomach tightened into a baseball. Don't tell Papa, Phoebe said. He'll send George away to that army school. I'll be good, George promised. I will. I really will. You better be, Aunt Daisy said. So that's my reading for today. I will be back tomorrow to keep reading. Have a great day. There's a lot of stuff that you can do online. Go to our Scholastic Learn at Home site and you'll find some great reading and all sorts of cool stuff to keep you busy today. Make sure you do some reading um, on your own. And I will be on Facebook and Twitter if you have any questions. I want to hear from you. So have your mom get in touch or your dad or anyone who's looking after you today. Bye-bye.